operators do we have in the room? Okay, how many vendor service kind of people? How many bankers? Okay, that's the guy you want to go see afterwards. He's handing out 3% debt. I've been doing this a long time. I've, and as he said, Michael said, 40 years. Just to, I, I've been doing it when this carpet was popular. That's how long I've been doing it. Yeah. Shag carpet was in. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is I think there's, a, you know, over the course of almost 40 years, I haven't hit 40 years yet, but almost 40 years, I have seen a lot of companies fail. Private companies, public companies, not-for-profits, I've seen them fail a lot. And when I look at it, I've always asked the question, why do they fail? And there's no one answer. So I thought this would be a good thing to share with you is my perspective about why companies fail. And you may not agree with me, which is fine. I'm going to leave a little time at the end for some Q&A. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're all successful. You know, when somebody has a bad headline in a newspaper, it hurts all of us. So, you know, my goal today is for all of us to be successful and have a little bit of a provocative conversation. And again, I'll try to leave some time at the end to answer questions. So this is my, uh, my warning to you. Uh, the content may not be politically correct, but the purpose is to help you. So forgive me. I beg for forgiveness at the beginning. So I want to go through a variety of things that I think make us fail, right? And the number one, the number one biggest thing that I think makes us fail is this. Now just digest that for a second, would you? Just take that in. Does this resonate with anyone? No, okay. Well, let me explain it for you. I'll walk you through it. We have a habit of hiring from within, right? Hiring, hiring, hiring. Um, I'm going to mention some companies. Don't mean to offend anyone. So Brookdale hires from Sunrise. Sunrise hires from, from Atria. Atria hires from Leisure Care. Leisure Care hires from pick it, Oakmont. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, why have we done this? We've done this because we have the ability or the lack of ability to hire talent that doesn't know our industry. And we've been a growth industry. I, I can tell you this industry has exploded over the course of my 40 years. So what do we do? You know, if you get a new investor, well, who's, who can we hire that has experience? Well, they have experience. And so we hire people from other companies and we overly promote them and we overly compensate them. Now you may go, ooh, that's a touchy subject. You're going to overly compensate people? You know, I can't tell you how many people that I meet at conferences. There may be one in here, and I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. That's like, hey, I'm the chief operating officer of this company now. Well, you were my activities director four years ago. How did that happen? It's happening, right? So I am a big, big proponent of not hiring within the industry. In fact, I will tell you that a majority, 100% of my senior staff does not come from the industry. 100%. 100% of my corporate staff does not come from the industry. Where do they come from? Louis Vuitton, Coach, Microsoft, Eddie Bauer, um, Blue Nile, the diamond company. We don't get discounts, by the way. Um, so of 100%. And right now, out of our general managers, 86% do not come from the industry. We either grow them our own, or we hire from a, an, a, another industry. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute, right? But 100% of my senior staff does not come from my industry. Now, we have a thing at Aegis called the weaving of the quilt, OK? And the concept of the weaving of the quilt is that we look at the companies that we hire from, as opposed to the person. And we say, well, what can that company or culture teach us, right? This is our quilt. This is the companies that our corporate and management people come from. Just look at these. 
Microsoft, Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton, Hilton, Nordstrom's, Louis Vuitton, Target, LNT, Fairmont, Coach Hyatt. I mean, I don't have to read all of them. Blue Nile. These are the companies. Now you may say, why would you ever do that, Dwayne? Doesn't make sense, right? Because every time we get a piece of the quilt, every time, it allows us to build our culture, to build our knowledge, to build our intellect, to build our policies, to build our procedures, to build our training every time, right? This is our quilt. So I want you, for 10 seconds, to think about what your quilt looks like. Think about it. Are there going to be multi-billion dollar companies there? Or is it going to be filled with uh, marrying your cousin? What's it look like? Think about that. You may even jot down right now on your notepad, oh, what's my senior staff look like? And I will tell you, if you don't get out of that habit of marrying your cousin, your company's not going to go anywhere and you're going to fail. I promise you. Now, I talked a lot, a little, I mentioned the fact that the most important position, let me just ask the question, what is the most important position in senior housing? Care staff? What else? Anybody have a different opinion? Executive director. Yeah, we call them general managers, but executive director, right? This is the pivot position. I don't doubt that care staff are incredibly important, but who hires the care staff? The general manager. This is the tone center. The general manager sets the tone for the environment of your building. We like to look at the general manager as the CEO of this company. You know, whether that's a $7 million building or $20 million a year building, they're the CEO of that company. They have 20 staff or 50 staff or 100 staff or 200 staff. They are the CEO. So when you look at those people, you have to treat them different. Again, 86% of our people, of our general managers, are either outside of the industry, most of them from the hospitality industry, hotels. We love for hiring Four Seasons people. So if there are any Four Seasons people here, raise your hand. Um, and we love treating them differently. So what do we do? Well, let's talk about some taboos here, right? Compensation. Because no one ever talks about compensation. They don't like to talk about it. You may you know, have a uh, contract on, uh, on me after this conference because I'm going to talk about compensation. And I'm going to talk about how I view it. We can't hire a capable person even to run a 70-unit building for under $180,000. That's our starting rate. If you're a superstar in our company, meaning that you, know, you exceed the budget and expectations, everything, my expectation is that a general manager, even if you're running an 85-unit building, is going to make over $300,000. That's the reality. Now, if you're the CEO or COO or VP of Ops and your manager's here, you're probably getting some dagger looks at this moment, so I apologize. But how are we going to hire people that run a healthcare center, run a restaurant, run a hotel, run a cruise ship for what I was told by one of the largest companies in the country at $120,000? That's what they were paying. You can't hire competent people in a 3.5% unemployment market for $120,000. You just can't. So that's issue number one. That's the ticket to the game. You have to compensate people from a base salary right, and you have to bonus them for performance. Otherwise, you're not, you're, you're not going to uh, get the right people. You know, the old expression, if an eagle sees another bird, it must be an eagle, because pigeons don't fly that high. The reality is when you have good people, they, they, they propagate good people, right? And the same is true. If you have bad people, same is true. Now, the critical thing, and we just started doing this maybe 10 years ago, the critical thing for us is we give our new GMs, even if you've worked in senior housing for 20 years, which, again, we don't have, I think we have six or seven right now, we give them 100 days of training before we hand them the keys. Anybody give more than 100 days of training? OK, I don't see one hand going up. We give them 100 days of training. And for people that come to us with, from other industries, they say, oh, yeah, I started. My VP came in. 
they said, hey, here's, here's Joe the cook and Sally the housekeeper and Alice the nurse and, you know, I'll be around here for three or four hours today. Here's the keys. I'm praying it works for you, buddy. That's why we fail. We want to give them 100 days. Now, what happens during the course of that 100 days? A variety of things. First of all, we, we send them to a variety of buildings. We want them to get their recipe book with lots of recipes. And by that, I mean, when you go to one building, you may say, well, God, this is a great activities program. I go to another building, you go, well, they, I love the way they do assessments and care. You go to another building and say, oh, their admission process is incredible. So what ends up happening is once they go to six or seven buildings, they have, they've seen a lot of things. But beyond that, what they do is they have mentors in those buildings. So instead of calling their boss and go, God, I just don't understand this, and afraid to ask the stupid questions, it appears that they can ask these questions too. They may have six, eight, ten peers by the time they're done with 100 days. This, for us, was a game changer. Absolute game changer. So I, I really, really, really um, would encourage you to look at this. Now, I like to look at things that are used outside senior housing and say, how can that benefit? How can I inculcate that into my company to work for me? I happen to know a few Navy SEALs. And I was asking the Navy SEALs, how do you assess a person that can be a Navy SEAL? How do you vet them? To know, hey, this is, this is a superstar Navy SEAL, right? And they say, well, it's easy. Oops. I'm moving on too fast here. I don't think this linked up. All right, let me go to this. They said, it's easy, Dwayne. We have a trust component and we have a competency component. And I said, well, tell me more of that. And they go, well, if we can't trust someone, and these are numbered one through 10, if we can't get someone on to a six or seven in terms of trust, you know, then they're, they're just gone. Because if we can't trust them, we'll die. We'll die. The competency thing, we feel very confident about because we have incredible training. So we have incredible trainings. And I'm talking about the Navy SEALs. We have incredible training, so we can train people up but I can't trust people up. Does that make sense, right? So I was fascinated by this and I said, huh, I'm gonna do my own scale. And I've hired in senior housing over the last 40 years about 40, 30, 40,000 people. And I developed this scale and it has never failed me. And I'm gonna take you through an exercise here that you, you may meet a reality that you don't wanna meet, right? And I'm gonna explain this. So this southwest corner is called the easies. Now, why is it easy? Because if I can't get someone to a five-level trust or a five-level competency, it's easy. I invite you to join the competition. Okay? You let them go. Right? So those are easy people. Right? Now, loyal duds. And you may go, what's a loyal dud? I know everyone in this room has a loyal dud. And let me explain it to them. You love this person. They come in. They're, they're always on time. They bring you a latte. They, they, they know your, your kids' names. They're phenomenal. They're just incompetent. And you keep them because you love them, right? You love them and they're great people, but they're not gonna move the company forward. Now, I want you to think about this. Take three seconds and think about, oh, that's Joe. Oh, my God. How many of you have a loyal dud? Be honest. How many of you? Okay. Half the room have loyal duds. All right. These are the people that cause us to fail, right? And if you don't realize that and move on from that, you're going to fail. Now, let's talk about the cancers. The cancers are the ones that are really, really tricky. Why is that? Why do you think? Audience participation. Why? What? Destructive. They're really good. This is it. This is the temptress of our, of our staff. The person's competent. Man, they, they, they not only meet the budget, they exceed the budget. Their census is high. And they would stab you with a steak knife once you turn your back. They want to be you. They want to take over your company. They ruin your culture. They're, you know, you saw the slide before that I skipped over. They're, they're an Eeyore, not, not a, a Winnie the Pooh. They're negative, and you don't want to fire them because they're like, oh my God, they're such a good performer. 
I, I can't get rid of this person. They're so good. These are the people that will make you fail. These are the people that will be a cancer in your company, right? Now, be honest. Be honest. We're being transparent. We're being vulnerable here. We're in the trust tree. Come on. How many of you have cancers right now that you go, oh my God, this is a cancer? Okay? Probably 40% of the room. You have to look this in the face, right? When you have a chart like this, it's really easy to quantify and like, hmm, do I trust that person beyond a five? Nope, I don't, right? And then the others are easy. The bubble people are people that maybe you haven't had enough time to develop trust with, or you haven't had enough training to develop a competency. And then the others are obvious. These are your solid performers. They're above a 6'6", six, six, and your stars are in that top 8'8", eight, 9'9", eight, nine, nine, 10, 10 box, right? Pretty easy. This simple tool can help you succeed. I promise. Use it. I, I don't care if you copy it. Um, please use it. So again, I, I told you I like to, I, I, I read a lot. When I wake up at 6 a.m., I, I read for two to three hours. I don't drink coffee. My wife who's back there is like, you've never had a cup of coffee with me. I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. Um, drives Howard Schultz, who's a friend of mine at Starbucks, every time he sees me, he says, have you had a cup of coffee yet? Nope. He said, you're going to ruin my company. So I like to use things from other industries. And I was reading this kind of obscure physics article. Because I like stimulating my brain with other things other than senior housing. Has anyone ever heard of the Spain scale? OK, good. So this will be news to everybody. So. Some physics people were measuring wavelengths, right? And they said when two wavelengths of equal distance meet, they double in energy. Now, that may seem like a logical outcome and a duh factor for you. But the reality is uh, Newton uh, could not explain why that, why that theory was in existence. Neither could Einstein. As this theory evolved, Physicists started saying, hey, we can take this energy wavelength concept and we can, we can actually quantify emotion. They could quantify emotion in this room, both positive and negative emotions, right? And as they discovered this, they discovered how this affects people's outcomes, cultures, workforces, and so on. They discovered if you have a negative uh, span, and span stands for scale positive negative experience, if you had a negative span, that it can double, double the emotion, right? So if, if I got up here and started talking about how terrible the industry is and we're going to go bankrupt and everything else, all of a sudden that energy could double, right? Now, on a positive side, the same is true. If you have somebody that is an optimist and positive and everything else, that energy can double. Now, what, Dwayne, what relative, what, why is this relative to senior housing and my operations and everything else? It's relative because it's about leadership, right? And it's about culture. Now, here's was the most fascinating thing that I found that I took and, and took into my leadership with this, with this revelation. What do you think the most powerful emotion there is in, in this universe. That's measured, scientifically measured. What is it? Just shout it out. Love? How many think it's love? OK. What else? Fear? OK. How many think it's fear? OK. What else? Regret? How many think it's regret? OK. Here's what's the startling thing for me. The most powerful emotion, the most powerful emotion is authenticity. Authenticity. It's 4,000 times more powerful than love as an emotion. Authenticity. So I think about that, and I think, hmm, when I talk to my staff, you know, I talk about, you know, having an abusive dad, you know, being a poor kid. Uh, struggling with my weight, you know, it's like, oh, what, why do you do that? Well, because I can relate. People will hear me as a leader. 
And I think oftentimes leaders fail because we're plastic. We're not human enough. You know, we're, we're not vulnerable enough. Vulnerable and authenticity go hand in hand, right? And so we want to be what I call the Ken doll. Hey, I went to Harvard, have an F MBA, I have 2.3 children. Um, my, my wife's name is Buffy. She was in the Beta Phi. She sang in the choir. We go to church every third Sunday. I'm pretty perfect. What happens to that dishwasher that's never been to more than two countries, doesn't have a passport, only went to 10th grade? There's a disconnect, right? Can't relate to them. Can't relate to them. So authenticity is critically important. Two weeks ago, I worked as a care manager in one of our buildings. I like to do this. I mandate that my senior staff do this. I learned so much about the operations, about the people. You know, Now, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and being in the, in the building at 5 is not my favorite thing to do. I'll have to be honest. Um, but it's so necessary, and your staff see you on a different level. If you've never done this, I encourage you to do this on a regular basis. So, I love sports. I have one of the largest sports memorabilia collections that you'll ever see. Probably over 5,000 pieces of some of the rarest were rare. And so, again, I like following stories and so on. And in 1984, Bobby Knight uh, oversaw the, uh, the Olympics uh, basketball team. And we have this expression at Asia, you have to whip your, your good horses harder. And what does that mean? And I, I thought this story illustrated it better. So in 1984, Bobby Knight was, was uh, his team was playing Spain. And they were ahead by about 25 points. And uh, Bobby didn't feel that the team had enough energy. They were only ahead by 25. That's not enough win, right? Jordan was on the team, goes in at halftime. And he's, he's, he's telling the story, and he's like, what am I going to say to this team to get more out of them? You know, they're up by 25. They think they're going to cruise. What, what am I going to say to them? So he goes in the halftime. He goes, Michael, what the hell are you doing? What's going on with you? You, you were playing like you're in high school. Now, Michael would play 12 of the 20 minutes of the half. He'd scored 19 points, had 11 rebounds, and I think seven assists. And he's like, when are you going to play like Michael Jordan? And Michael's looking at him like, you got 19 points and 11 assists. And like, what the hell, right? Now, what was Bobby Knight trying to do? He was trying to send a message to his team that says, hey, if I'm yelling at Michael Jordan, who has 19, 11, and 7 at halftime in 12 minutes, what must, what must he think of my effort, right? And this, this is one of the reasons we fail. We spend more time with our horrible people than we do our good people. Make your good people examples of what the standard should be, right? Don't spend your time with the people that you think you're going to fire in two months. That, that's a loyal debt or a cancer. They're gone. Spend time with the people that can really score. This, this is something we do a lot. We spend time with our best, best people. I think one of the things that we focus on in this industry is the wrong, the wrong components. And I'm going to give you a great example. Any of your comp anybody in this room, their company on this list? No one wants to raise their hand. All right, I know you're bullshitting me. Some of you are on this list, OK? Why is this important? Why is, why is it important? that you have the 50 biggest operators. Why is it relative? Why is it important? Why is it, why is it germane? But every year, two or three people publish it. I, I mean, I love David Sless. I love Asha. Shout out to them. I have no ill will about them. But it's measuring the wrong thing. Big does not mean successful. Big does not mean profitable. Big does not mean a good culture. In fact, having done this for almost 40 years, I will tell you, go back and look at the list 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. The names have changed. Big does nothing. 
In fact, I think, my personal opinion, is big as a cancer for our industry. I want to be a super regional. What does that mean? That means I want to have enough buildings that I get economies of scale, but not too big that I don't forget the names of my general managers and their families and their kids, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll clean the national operator's clock every day of the week. Every day of the week. What I want to be is Ritz-Carlton before Marriott bought them. Ritz-Carlton was a worldwide name when they had one building. It was the Ritz, right? That's what I want to be. I want to be the most profitable entity in the country in terms of my building success. I'm going to, and I'm going to show you this. So we tend to get a very favorable evaluation in cap rates from our lenders. This is, this is what we should be measuring. These are the last, uh, what is it, two, four, seven buildings that we operate in Seattle. And this is a year-to-date number. The, the actual monthly numbers are higher than this. So this is an NOI per unit graph, right? Everybody understand this concept? I need to explain it. It's net operating income per unit, right? You can take a picture of it if you want. I'm fine with that. These are the last seven communities. We have some that are over 5,000. I will tell you in the last month, they've reached over 5,000. Our new buildings, our projections for new buildings are 6,000 NOI per unit. 6, Anyone doing more than 6,000 NOI per unit that's not a CCRC? Anybody doing more than 5,000? Anybody doing more than 4,000? Anybody doing more than 3,000? OK. The industry average is 2360. Now, why am I telling you this? So if, if the average is 2360, I have to look at my notes for this because it's math. If the average is 2360, and you have a 100-unit building, and let's say in normal times, not today, you're not going to get it, but in normal times, you'd get a six cap. That means that that building would be worth a little bit more than $47 million, right? Now. We tend to get a preferred cap rate from our, our evaluators, our people that do, do our appraisals, and our banks. So if I'm looking at 6,000 on a 100 unit building, that's 7.2 million. And let's say our cap is a little bit more favorable, it's five and a half, that's 131 million. Again, the industry average would be a value of 47 million versus 130 million. Why am I telling you that? Because if you're a big company that's stamping these things out like crazy, I can build one to year three and be as profitable. I can build one to year three. I don't have to be, have 150 buildings to be profitable. I just have to have one that kicks butt. We have a building right now that's in construction that we think we're going to make $80 million on, one building. Okay, So I don't, I don't have to be big. I just have to be great. And I'd rather be great than big. One of the mistakes that we make is that we don't align our revenue with our real estate cost. You know, we have, a, we have about 35, 40% of the company in California. And people say, well, Twain, there's great markets in California. Why don't you build more in California? Because we have about 350, 400 million in construction right now in Seattle. And I say, well, my, my revenue and my real estate are incongruent. And they say, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, land is more in California. Construction costs are more in California. And uh, my community fees on my last building I just opened, the penthouse. Now, community fee, most people think of as two months rent. Our community fee on our penthouse in Kirkland Waterfront just got $274,000. That's a community fee that's non-refundable. That goes straight to the bottom line. Okay, 274,000. Our building in Laurelhurst, our penthouse will go for 450,000. We may end up in, by the time the building fills, with $12 million in community fees. Again, straight to the bottom line. I can't, California does not pay that, will not pay that. I don't have enough brand awareness and competitors will undercut me. So I may get a $50,000, $60,000 community fee on the same building with higher real estate costs and higher building costs. So my internal rate of return, not the same. Make sense? So I have to look and say, 
hey, do do my charges that I'm getting from revenue, what I received on revenue, do they match the construction costs that I have? And usually, usually they don't. Now here's a big reason that we fail. Now remember, I was the executive vice president of Sunrise, so I know of what I speak. Does this resonate with anyone? This is capital. This is the Development Express. And here's operations running for your lives, right? Hey, we're going to steamroll. We're going to put out 27 buildings this year, and it's going to, you know, I hope this works, right? This, this, if there's one slide you want to take a picture of, it's this. Capital doesn't care if you don't have enough managers. Capital doesn't care if you don't have enough care staff. Capital doesn't care if there's a nurse shortage. Capital is there to be deployed. That's, that's their essence, right? And no, no uh, judgments against the one banker that's in this room. That's a telling sign. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a character flaw. It's their job. It's what they do, right? So they're there to drive the steamroller, and they get in the development part. My, my son Adam is here. He's speaking on Tuesday. He's the uh, president of our development company. He's like, Dad, we got to develop here. And I'm like, no, 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 let's let operations catch up, right? Operations has to catch up. And again, if you're great, not big, and your buildings perform, you don't, you don't have to be on this, you know, running from the steamroller. It's not necessary. So, you know, we have to have aligned interest in this. And this is why, you know, again, companies fail. They don't have a line interest. They don't, they don't understand um, you know, the fact that uh, we don't have enough staff to operate the buildings. So I had a conversation with one of my staff who gave me notice, a longtime staff member who I really care about, and he was going to another company. And I asked him this question, do you know who really owns your company? Seems like a pretty simple question, right? Who really owns your company? He goes, oh yeah, I met with the CEO. I said, well, the CEO doesn't own the company. He goes, oh, Dwayne, he does. I'm, I, I hate to tell you, but he does. I interview with him. I met him. He does. He said, well, let me show you an article. Half the company was owned by an Asian offshore. I go, well, did he tell you this? He goes, uh, no. I go, well, they own 51% of that company. They're, they're essentially a manager. That CEO could be fired if he terminated. See, this is where interests become misaligned. You have a REIT, you have a foreign investor, you have a private equity group, and the alignment and the interest in the objectives become misaligned. We own the majority of our real estate ages in-house. We have 300 private investors. I would say 280 of them are personal friends of mine. Their combined net worth is north of $30 billion. So when we go to raise 30, 40, 50 million dollars, it's done in a week and it's oversold. So we don't have to rely on the private equities of the world or the foreign investors or the REITs or anything else. We have it and our interests are aligned. And we tell our equity investors, hey, you get one great privilege. You get a phenomenal return. And after that, you need to sit in the, in the back seat and shut up. I'm serious. That's my exact language. And if you don't like that language, please don't invest with us. I have. One person that calls me every year, we, have, we send out no investment reports, zero, none. I have one person that calls me every year and says, hey, can you tell me about my investment? Goes, yeah, I'll spend 10 minutes on the phone with you, and that's it. We don't have any accounting analysts that send out reports, and this is what you do. Now, we have a, we, we're partners with Blue Moon, and we have a call with them every month. But I even told them, hey, we're not going to do all these big reports and everything else. Why? Because I want my people making money. I don't want my people reporting about possibility of making money. I want them making money, right? That's a different concept in our industry. So I want to talk to you about something that uh, I think uh, may help you make money immediately. And the Finleys that are here from Denver came up and spent some time with me. Great, great company, great people. And I talk to them a lot about this. And you can talk to them about how it's helped their company. How many people in this room use a level system for care? Oh, God, I was hoping no one would raise their hand. Here's why. Think about the dynamic of our staff and, and who they are. 
their care stuff, right? And they have to give the bath. They have to, you know, make, you know, be in contact with the residents. They have to love them and so on. And then those same people were going to demand, tell us when care changes. It's kind of an incongruent personality trait, right? I want you to love this person, then we're going to hammer and charge her $400 more. Well, the trust goes out the window. What happens when you're on a level system is that, let's say this is level one and level two and level three and so on. We go and audit these people. In fact, my wife, Therese, who's here in the audience, used to have a company called Nurses to Go that did this for, for a living. And she would go and tell people, hey, I'll just charge you $30, $40 an hour for my nursing time, and I, but I get 50% of the first month savings of what I find. And people go, oh, God, that's a no-brainer. Well, then she'd go in and she'd find $50,000 that they weren't charging for in a month. Like, oh, well, that's $25,000. Yeah, well, I found that. You, you know. I, really? What happens is because of the personality of our care staff, they do not want to bump people to this next level, right? For one or two points, they don't want to put them here. They're like, oh, let's just leave them right at the top of level one. So what happens by the time they get into level two is they're at the top of level two. You never, and, and if you don't believe me, go home and graph your people. Go 100 people and go graph them. You never see people at the beginning of the level when you're on level system, ever, ever, ever. I've done this a thousand times, believe me. You never have. So you have what in retail is called slippage or breakage. You're giving the care and not charging for it. I'm telling you, this is hundreds of thousands, depending on how big your company is, is millions of dollars. Now, let me be vulnerable with you and tell you where Aegis screwed up. We, had a, uh, we went to electronic records about three years ago. And we used to have a SWAT team that would go out and do physical assessments, five or six nurses that would go out building by building and do assessments. And so about six months ago, seven months ago, um, I met with my president. I said, when's the last time we did a physical assessment? She goes, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. We have these e-records, and it's much more efficient, and they capture the care, and it's great. I said, you know, could you do an old guy a favor? Just, just send out five nurses. Go do six betas, right? Come back and tell me if you find money in the betas. Come back in six weeks. Six weeks go by. She meets with me. I say, hey, well, how's the beta going? Her head's like a little sullen, head down. Uh, you didn't find any money. No, we found a lot of money. Really? How much? Well, by the time we were done with our buildings, we found $20 million on uncharged care. $20 million a year. $20 million. And we're good at this. $20 million. Now, we had to be aggressive with some. We had to back off some of our rates. We had to do something. We captured about 15 of it. We, the census dropped 1%, great. For 15 million cash, the census can drop 1%. We made that trade off. Do this, do this, or you will fail. Do not be afraid of charging more if your quality is good. One of the principles at Aegis is a thing called, we call 90-90-90. In the first 90 feet, 90% 90 of your impression will be made up 90% of the time. Or first 90% of your impression in the first 90 feet will be made up 90% of the time. So when you walk in, drive into the driveway, if you're not seeing something that's great, when you're met by the concierge, if she doesn't stand up and greet you, if you're not uh, impressed by the lobby, in that first 90 seconds and 90 feet, 90% 90 of your impression is going to be made up. Test your own staff on this, on the 90, 90, 90. It's critical. Now, when people come to us, the average resident is going through seven tours before they choose us. And I talk about three levels of tour. Level one is, hey, how you doing? Brochures are on the front desk there. Hey, that's our dining room. I'm super busy right now. You know, come back at another time. That's level one. And we laugh at that, but I would say about 40% of the time we do this. I know, because secret shoppers tell me. And then we, you know, and I secret shop other buildings as well. Second level of tour is, you walk a person through and you go, this is our dining room where we dine. This is our activities room where we activate. Um, this is our, our, uh, our, our lobby where we have lattes. You know, you walk through. Third level of tour is what people are looking for. Third level of tour is where we give them credibility, we build trust, and we personalize it. 
So before that tour ever comes in, you find out as much information about that resident as possible. Geez, I grew up in Walla Walla, Washington. I'm a Seattle Mariners fan, you know, whatever. And you look to connect with that person. Why are you moving in? Oh, my mom's food choices are not great. And so when you come through, you go, hey, I want to introduce you to your chef. I know you like Italian cuisine. Oh my God, he makes the best stuffed manicotti in the, in the universe. In fact, you're having lunch here and he made stuffed manicotti for you today. And as that person goes to leave, you go, hey, I know you're from Walla Walla. You know, I just found this article on Walla Walla, ironically enough, and it shows how it's changed. And it's gone from one winery in 1978 to over 300 today. Oh, and one last thing. I know you're a Mariners fan, and I picked up this Ken Griffey uh, card for you so you can think about us on your way out, right? That is the personalization. That's the reliability, the, the, the concern, the credibility, the trust, right? Those little things that we do that we forget about. So I'm running out of time quickly here, but I want to just talk about a concept called the value line. And our customers come to us expecting a certain value. I'm going to pay you this, and this is my expectation. It's the value line. I, I pay something for a certain value. If you go to Starbucks and you ask for a latte, you know, you, you look for a value for that $7 latte. If it's not good, you don't go back, right? And so, you know, on one side it's affordable, if you give exceptional care and whatever. The reason people leave us is because we don't meet or exceed this value line. So I want to tell you a quick story here, because I've got eight minutes left. This is Taylor Swift. My, uh, I have nine grandchildren. My granddaughters um, came to me and said, Poppy, that's what they call me, we, we want to go to Taylor Swift. So my wife, T, is a huge Taylor Swift fan as well. And I said, oh, God, do we have to? And they said, absolutely. And then I went to look for tickets. And guess what? Tickets in normal venues don't exist. So I had to buy tickets for 12 people and spend more than them than I did on my first house. And um, we go, we walk in the venue, and my life changed. It's like, I'm, I'm in another alternate dimension. And I walk in, and I see this man that weighed about 300 pounds in a pink tutu. And as a man that's in his mid-60s, I looked at him and I started to go, did you win? And my granddaughter said, no. You cannot judge. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, no, we, this is a judgment-free zone. I'm like, really? I can't make fun of people like I normally do and get into my old, old man judgment? They're like, no. And then my granddaughters lined up and they high-fived people as, as they came in. They gave out these bracelets. They signed each other's, and I'm like, oh my God, what's happening here, right? It was such a feeling of love and endearment and friendship and weird outfits and all kinds of stuff, right? So I go in the concert. We have great seats. We're right, you know, right almost first row. And um, Taylor Swift plays for four and a half hours straight. Four and a half hours. I've never been to a concert in my life, and it's like, a Broadway musical, a rock concert, a, a, a church revival. It's like, oh my God. And people are hugging and crying and loving each other. And I tell my wife halfway through, I got to go to the bathroom. And I know this is going to be, I'm, I'll probably be back in an hour. You know, uh, you, track my phone if I don't come back because there's 73,000 people here, right? I go to the bathroom and, and it's in the corridor where the snack bars are. There's no one there. I'm like, am I in the wrong place? And I, there's the snack bars. I see the staff at the snack bar. There's no one in the bathroom. No one would leave the concert to go to the bathroom because they didn't want to miss one minute. No one would get a, a glass of water or a pretzel. Why? Because she is up here in terms of expectation. Okay? She blew away their expectation. When I left, there was 5,000 fans standing outside the concert. At 11.30 at night, there was 400 people in line to buy merch. 400 people in line at 11.30 at night to buy merchandise. See, we have to think about how do we blow away the expectation? 
She's created a culture, a merchandise empire, you know, so much more. And as leaders, we have to think like this. We have to think, how do we blow away the customer in such a way? How do we create the Taylor Swift phenomenon? One of the ways that we do that is we have to get people who are non-senior housing leaders in our midst. Last October, my wife and I, because we work with Pope Francis and a, and a board called the Galileo Foundation, our motivation is to end child sex slavery and a horrible thing called child organ harvesting. And we work with the Vatican to do this. So we got invited to this, to this conference um, called Faith and Philanthropy. And you know, we've been to the Vatican multiple times and so on. In fact, we just got my nine grandkids baptized there and it was great. And uh, they said, there's 100 world leaders here. And I'm like, well, are we supposed to be there? Is this the right conference? Are we an imposter? And uh, they said, no, not only are you there, you're going to speak. There was only 18 of the 100 people that spoke. And you know, here, here's who I sat next to, this small guy. You may recognize him. He's the richest man in the world. He happens to be my neighbor in Seattle. We live four houses apart. And so we spent three days together and talked a lot about, you know, Life, nothing to do with senior housing, obviously. This is his fiance, Lauren, and that's me, and that's my wife. And uh, I asked him, I said, Jeff, what, what's the one thing you could tell me as a businessman? He said, speed to pivot. Like, what? He goes, when something works or something fails, it's speed to pivot. You run towards it if it works, and if it fails, you automatically eliminate it quickly. Brilliant advice. Now, I would never get that advice from a guy that ran a senior housing company, but Jeff Bezos gave it to me, and I was, uh, I was delighted that he did. Now, how do we evaluate ourselves? You know, we, we tend to evaluate ourselves not on who has the biggest company, who, who has the most properties. We do a net promoter score, which is a customer service score. Anybody use net promoter scores? All right. So we're a 42. That was last year. These are other companies. Apple's a 41. Facebook's now negative. You know, Amazon 25, whatever. Nordstrom's 23. We're 42. That's the likelihood of a, another person recommending you. And I, I, we have when we do our board, we we do put up our competitors there. I didn't want to embarrass anyone because the scores on net promoter scores on our top competitors are negative. I think there was one that was above 10. So look at yourself from outside the box, right? Look at yourself from outside senior in industry. You'll never get ahead if you keep marrying your cousin, I promise you. Now this next year is gonna to be tough. We have an expression, staying alive to 25. We have 400 million in floating debt right now. I, I pay about uh, $2 million a month more than I did two and a half years ago in floating debt. We have a, a, a very, rocky river that we're going to go through here in the next probably 15 to 18 months. There's about $1.5 trillion in debt coming due in 24. It's going to cause banks to fail. It's going to cause businesses to fail. I'm not talking about senior housing. I'm just talking about real estate debt. It's going to cause a lot of people to fail. And you know that's why I did this presentation for you, is that I don't want you to be one of them. So thank you very much. Dwayne, that was an amazing presentation.